Well hello and welcome again and for the second week in a row I'm um, pre-recorded Maddie as opposed to a live stream live version of me um, but I believe God is going to meet you in the process of what we're recording this morning and um, he is going to actually grow you and uh, expand your understanding of how he works in your life. Um, we've been looking at uh, the subject of pain, suffering, and grief over the last few weeks, and we've been journeying through uh, the book of Job together. And uh, I don't know about you, but um, as I've revisited this book, um, I have again been um, just growing in my understanding of how God actually works in my life through some of the most challenging seasons. Um, and it's not maybe what we would actually hope God would do in terms of how um, how we're actually growing in life, but it's so often true, isn't it? It's the hardest times in life that we grow the most. Um, and as uh, not fun as it might be, when we actually go through painful seasons, God is often working uh, in our life in a, a very significant way during those times. Uh, um, today I want to conclude our series by looking at God with us in our pain. And it's something I have touched on um, through all of my messages that God is there with us as we journey through pain. But I want us to kind of take in a zoomed in version of um, this particular area of, uh, of focus and before we kind of dive in together to uh, this subject, let's pray together. So Father, I just thank you that um, you are God of every aspect of life, that the good, um, that you are God over the bad and the struggles and, um, and the, the painful areas of life even, and that uh, you encounter us and that you meet us and you reveal to us new things about who you are, even in the, the most challenging and dark seasons of life. Lord, I really want to pray for, for us as a church that you would grow us, that you would uh, talk to us today as I share some thoughts. Um, <coughs> in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So um, I just want to hit on a, a few things that we uh, need to kind of set up as some frames to uh, the understanding that we, we need around this whole area of uh, pain, suffering, and grief. I don't believe that God is the author of pain, suffering, and grief. And Jesus, as Bill Johnson says, is perfect theology. When you look at Jesus and his life, he never allowed sickness to remain on someone. As soon as he knew someone was sick, he always dealt with it, even Lazarus. Uh, ultimately, that um, he allowed um, the process of Lazarus, yes, for a very small time, and he actually uh, raised him from the dead. Um, and uh, Jesus healed everyone that came to him without exception. He never sent anyone to Dr. Luke, never told anyone, hey, you need to learn some lessons first. He always healed uh, people, and he ruined every funeral that we read about connected with him, including his own in the Bible. Um, the Bible also says about God that God himself has no uh, shadow, that he is pure light, and in him there are no shades of grey. Uh, and what it means by that is that God is perfect, um, and that there is no maliciousness to God, there is no uh, that, that there is no malevolence to God, that God is uh, perfect love. Um, and light is attributed to him uh, because of this. Um, and I, I believe that is something that we actually need to hold on to when we look at the, this subject of pain, suffering and grief. Although that as we're going to see that God will actually use whatever life throws at us or whatever the enemy uh, brings our way um, and even will take sin itself and use it in such a way that through redemption that we can be thankful and grateful for all that we learn about God ourselves and other people through that um, that is the the redemptive nature of God that is the wonder of God um, and the trouble is that when we let 
go of that perspective, um, it can actually create what I call a Frankenstein type perspective of God. See, um, the, the story of Job uh, paints a picture that God actually allows suffering to come into Job's life and, um, and that he's okay with that and he sanctions that. And although the text reads this, what we forget is that actually the Bible isn't a, uh, a flat document. There is this linear progression of who God is that, that grows and grows and grows until we see the, the fullness of the revelation of who God is um, that culminates in who Jesus is. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Job really is the, the, um, the beginning of our understanding of who God is, biblically speaking. Um, historically, uh, scholars tell us that Job is probably the very first uh, created uh, biblical text. It, it is the oldest writings in the Bible, um, and it's the earliest uh, the, the earliest book of the Bible that was written, believe it or not, it came before Genesis, historically in terms of when it was written. Um, and so in that sense, it's an early perspective of what God is like and how he works. It's not that the, we, we don't get biblical truth out there. It's not that it's any less sacred and holy than the latter books of the Bible, the, 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 the Gospels and the revelation of Jesus. But we need to hold in mind that actually uh, some of the things that, that we see um, shared in the story um, actually get a definition, um, a, a final definition in the person of Jesus. So um, what is God's perspective of healing is ultimately answered in Jesus Christ. He healed everyone that came to him. Um, what is God's perspective of suffering? Well, um, we see that ultimately that there is this clash of kingdoms that is revealed in the story of Jesus um, and that God's kingdom is pure light um, and that uh, whilst God definitely can use the enemy to, to progress um, his kingdom and his purposes in the world, uh, the enemy is broken and is evil and destined for destruction. Um, but that said, and I want to show uh, to to actually bring in this caveat to everything I've just said above there, um, is that actually uh, some of our perspectives in our stream of of the goodness of God are a bit jaundiced in their perspective. They're not complete in who God is. And um, the story of Job can provide us with some color and definition um, that will actually expand our perception of, of just the, the wonder of God, the mystery of God, um, and the unknowableness of God, which we in our stream can actually be lacking, although we embrace this beautiful picture of, well, God is like Jesus. Um, and so we need to lay hold of that, uh, especially for, for those of you that have actually grown up in our stream, that, that in our stream, because we so hold on to the goodness of God and the wonder of God, what happens is that when suffering or mystery shows up in our life, it can really uh, topple our understanding of what God is like and shipwreck our faith because what we come to believe of God does not stack up with our theology. And we'll touch on on that in a minute um, and uh, and so another thing we can take out of the story of Job is that God will take everything life throws at us and use it for his purpose so although God is not the the causer of the pain and the suffering and the grief in and around our lives the God will actually take those things and use this to actually uh, grow us in our lives to to actually reveal something new of who he is in our life and to even bless us through it uh, Romans 8 uh, talks about how God turns all things to good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And sometimes the all things that God takes are bad things that have happened to us. Um, 
accidents or, or tragedies that come our way or, or mysteries. And God takes that and, and that he uses that and he redeems that in such a way that actually um, in a, a strange kind of way that we can actually be thankful for the trials that come our way. And we see this in the life of Job, that the, the Job at the end of the story would no, by no means turn around and actually say to God, well, I want to do that again. That was so fun. Um, well, that was awesome. Let's do that again, God. No, uh, but he would be saying, God, wow, what I know about you now, what I know about the way that you work now is, uh, is so much grander and so much bigger and so, so much more than what I started with. And I'm so thankful for that season in my life. I'm thankful that though that, that was hard and painful and that hurt. I, I'm thankful for now what you have done with what you allowed me to go through. And so God will take the things that you're going through in life, the, the challenges, the pain, the suffering, the mystery in your life, um, and God will, will take whatever life throws at you and he will redeem it. Um, and so if it isn't good yet, if you're going through something hard and it's not good yet, it means that God is not over and done with uh, redeeming what he is working um, to bring about good through those circumstances. And in fact, I, I just want to pause at this moment and I want to pray for you if you are going through something. If you're in the midst of a furnace season right now and you've not seen the good in this, it means it's not over. And I just want to pray for strength and endurance and that God will actually do that which he promises in Romans 8, 28 in the midst of your circumstances. So let's just pause at this juncture and pray this on um, yourself or people around you that you know are in a furnace season. So God, I pray right now for anyone in our congregation, um, anyone watching this live stream that is in a furnace season. Lord, if they're, they're still burning, if the things around them are still burning, it means you're not done yet. And I pray, Lord, for strength to withstand and be patient for you to redeem that which you will do, Lord. Because you promise that you will turn all things to good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And I pray that you would do that for those people that are in a, a lengthy season of burning, Lord. And I thank you in advance that you're going to do that for them. Amen. Great. So the next point I want to bring out from um, this uh, perspective of God with us in our suffering is that God, that, that suffering, although God doesn't cause it, uh, God can use it in our lives to grow our picture of who God is. And, and I want to explore this uh, point in the story of Job uh, to show you that Job's picture of God at the end of the story is much bigger and grander and broader than the picture of God that he saw um, at the beginning of the story. Um, th there was a joke I heard a number of years ago of a little girl who asked God, um, not asked God, asked her mother what God was like. Um, and God said, well, uh, sorry, the mother said, well, God is, is everywhere. Uh, and the little girl looked around and said, do you mean she's, uh, God is in the kitchen with us right now? And the mum said, yes, he's in this kitchen right now. He's everywhere. And, and the little girl asked her mother and said, well, if God is everywhere with us right now, does it mean that he's in this jam jar? And she holds up a jam jar and the mum says, yes. And so she grabs the lid of the jam jar and sh shuts the lid on the jam jar and says, gotcha. Um, and um, uh, and the point I want to make is that God is bigger than any of our theologies that we have of him. Theology really is the study of God. And whether or not you've been to a Bible school or done uh, an official theology cl uh, class, if you're a believer, you have a theology of God. And really, uh, your theology of God is your understanding of who God is and how he actually works in your life. 
Um, and what we see in the story of Job is that Job has a theology of God, which is very much tracking with the theology that his friends also have. And if you remember from previous weeks, I shared that actually Job's friends struggle with what they see happen in Job's life is that they have this uh, black and white theology that God is a retributive God, that, that actually if, um, if you do good, you will be blessed. If you do bad, you will be uh, punished for the bad that you do. And in the proportion of the good, um, that you will receive the measure according to what you sow. And really we see this theology expanded on in the New Testament. And it's true that God is a sowing and reaping God. The Bible talks about that. But what we see in the story of Job is that sometimes um, there are other things that are going on alongside the other uh, the, the the general principles of how God works that actually trump those things or cause them not to work in those ways and the trouble with our theology is that they can become prisons in which God is locked in and the more watertight our theologies of God tend to be the more that they actually become not a prison for God but for a prison for ourselves and what we see out of the story of Job is that actually God, um, as he reveals more of himself to Job and to Job's friends, is that the prisons that they become contained in around their watertight understanding of the way life works and how God works, it, it gets blown apart in such a way that actually they have an expanded view of God. Um, uh, one of my uh, one of my professors at uh, theological school um, said this really widely. He says that we need to be spacious with our theology. That whilst we embrace um, our understandings of God that grow and refine over time as we grow deeper in our understanding of who God is in and through our walk with God and our relationship with Him, that we hold. Uh, we hold on to what we believe, but we hold on to it loosely. Um, and so we see in the story of Job that God uses what happens to him to break Job out of his theological prisons. In Job chapter 23, um, Job begins to actually uh, present to God a case against him because how he understands he should be working isn't actually equating with what he's experiencing in his life. He's righteous. He's more than righteous. Um, and he knows that. And yet Job is experiencing suffering in his own life. And so Job says to, to God, he said, even today my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to God's dwelling. If I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments, I would find out, um, find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. There the upright can be established as can establish their innocence before him. And there I would be delivered forever from my judge. And really what Job is saying here is, if I have my day in court with God, I will present my case to him and I will be proven that actually what is happening to me is unfair. And whilst it's true that actually what happened to Job was unfair, there was a much bigger story at play that Job does not see and does not understand. And in Job's, um, Job's processing with his friends about the injustice of what's happening to him, he comes dangerously close to what his friends do, which is to actually accuse God unfairly. Um, and, and in effect, Job's uh, protest about what's happening to him um, are, uh, form three particular questions uh, which we often ask 
to God when our theologies stop working, when we hit a, a roadblock in life, when life doesn't go as we think it's go, going to. And Job asks these three questions about God. I thought you were. I thought you were a God of retribution. Um, and then the second question is, I thought that you would. Um, I thought that you were a God of retribution. And because you are a God of retribution, I thought you would show up and bless me because I have lived righteously. And then thirdly, Job says this, I thought that you could. See, I thought that you were a God of retribution who would show up and bless me because I've lived righteously. And I thought that you could do this because you are the God of everything. And really what Job is saying is, but you're not. God, you're not who I thought you were. Um, and sometimes in the midst of our suffering, when life doesn't add up or God stops adding up in the way that we think he should, it can cause us to uh, wrongly assume things about God. Um, I, I say this often to my kids when they're hurting or they're upset, that, that never make a decision about anything in life uh, when you're actually in a place of deep pain. We never actually uh, have a good perspective out of that place. We always need to process our place, uh, pain. Uh, we always need to process our hearts to a place of peace. Um, and then make a decision around our circumstances. And really the questions that Job asks, I thought you were, I thought you would, I thought you could, were not bad questions, but they were in fact the wrong questions. Um, theologians often point out that actually, uh, that God never directly answers Job's questions at all. Um, and uh, whilst it's often true that God never answers our, uh, uh, the reasons for suffering in our life, he loves to ask, answer questions that we ask of him. I, I can remember some of the biggest breakthroughs in my life came off the back of pain in my life that, that caused me to ask questions of God. Um, and those, those questions opened um, fresh revelation that, that sent my life on, on particular courses and, uh, that, uh, and a, a particular route, uh, which, which were revolutionary for me, that were, were life-changing for me. Um, for example, um, when I was leading my previous church and, and we were struggling as a church, um, that, that they were full of lovely people and uh, there was incredible uh, gifted nest within the church of these incredible people but the church really wasn't firing and I got before the Lord and said what's going on here I thought we were doing what we were meant to be doing I thought we were preaching the gospel in the way that actually people would be one but I'm not seeing that happen and I and I cried out and I said what am I missing teach me how to fish like you fish um, and off the back of that God opened up uh, a, a new understanding that led, into, led me into a fresh revelation of the gospel of the kingdom. My question about the pain and the struggle um, and the tension that I, I was going through in my life caused me to ask a question that God said, thank you, Maddie, for finally asking that question. I've long wanted to uh, answer this for you. Um, and it became this this. A gateway into this deeper understanding of God. And I believe that Job's pain uh, in this causes him to ask these questions about God in a way that God says to Job, Job, thank you that you've asked me these questions. And actually, um, Job uh, gets his answer to his question in chapter 38, where God reveals himself in a new way to Job. And in verse four of chapter 38, God, um, God reframes Job's three questions, where Job's three questions were, I thought you, thought you were, I, I thought you would, and I thought you could. And uh, interestingly enough, God answers each of these three questions directly in the next few verses by saying, to Job's first question, I thought you were, he says, where were you, Job? And then to Job's second questions, I thought you would, he says, 
Who are you, Job? And then to the third question, I thought you could. God says to Job, are you able? And so listen to this. In verse 4, in response to I thought you were, God says, where were you? He says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. And then in verse 5, he answers the second question uh, of Job. I thought you would. Um, and, and God asks him, who are you? Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? And then the third question he asks, uh, answers in verse 31. He says, are you able? Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their season or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Um, and, um, and, and in response, to Job's questions of, I thought you were, God reveals what Job is actually really asking. And, and so this is a key point for you here. Sometimes the questions that we're asking of God are, the, uh, are not quite the right questions that we need to ask of God. And sometimes the breakthroughs that we need in our suffering um, are because we've not reached the place where we're actually asking the right questions of God or getting the things that we need to get in the midst of our circumstances. Um, and so it's important that when we're in a season, um, what seems like this perpetual season of suffering, that we ask God, is there something that I'm missing? Is there something I should be getting? Is there something I should uh, be doing in the midst of my challenge? I can re uh, remember back to a season of uh, testing in my life, a trial a season in my life. And my spiritual dad, who was looking in um, with, with great compassion and sympathy to me as I walked through this challenging season, he, he, he gave me a really helpful tool. He said, make sure that you get what you're meant to be getting in the midst of this season. And, and I can remember listening to my spiritual dad in the midst of this and going, hey, there's some wisdom in what he's saying here. I really need to make sure that what it is in the midst of this trial that uh, is fully embedded in me, that I fully have apprehended. Um, and I, I, I remember asking God in the midst of that, off the back of that question, I said, God, help me to get what it is that I need out of this season. Help me not to miss it. Help me to lean into the midst of this trial. Um, and what was amazing was that I got some understanding of what it was that God was building into me. And that understanding in the midst of the trial allowed me to lean in to the, the fire in such a way that actually um, it shortened the season of trial. Not shortened the season of trial. It ended the season of trial in my life. And I say it didn't shorten it because I don't believe that we can shorten the seasons of trial in our life, but we can extend them. Um, and we extend them when we miss what it is that God wants us to get. See, God will send us around the mountains as many times as it takes for you to get what it is that it, uh, he is intending for you to get. Um, and sometimes if you are circulating, circ circulating a season um, that, you're, uh, that seems perpetual and you can't get out of, it could be that you've not apprehended what it is that God wants to do in your life or grow or, or to die in your life. All right. So Job, um, Job, out of this revelation of um, who are you, where God says um, to him, who are you? He, he sees that God actually in comparison to him is so much bigger and unknowable than he uh, realized. And in response to his question, where were you? With God's question, where were you? He realizes, I'm just a man. I'm a nobody. You're so much bigger and grander and powerful than me. And then to the third question that God asks Job, are you able? He sees that actually, God, you are more than able, but I'm not. I'm just a human being. 
And in chapter 40, verse 3, uh, out of this realization, Job says to God, I am unworthy. He comes into this place of uh, stillness and quietness. He stops wrestling with God and he submits to this new understanding of who God is. And you can tell you're actually coming to an end of your, your uh, trial or your season um, of wrestle when you actually come to the end of yourself and you come to a place of stillness. And you come to a place of um, acceptance. Um, and it's very often the sign that you're actually uh, coming to the end of the wilderness season in your life. Um, and so Job in verse 4 of chapter 40 says, I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I can put a hand over my mouth. Oh, sorry, I put a hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I'll say no more. Um, and then in chapter 42, he reiterates this, this resolution of this new revelation of the bigness and the grandeur of God he has arrived at. I know, God, that you can do all things. In other words, to who are you? Where God says, who are you compared to me? And he says, God, you are God. You're, you're everything. You're bigger and grander and more mighty than me. And I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, um, I've come to a place of resolution that you're bigger and more unknowable than I could ever see. Verse 3, he goes on to say, you asked, who is this that obscures my plan without knowledge? Surely, Job says, I spoke of things I did not understand. And really, it's a confession to God that Job actually uh, had, unbeknownst to him, put God in this box of this is what you are. And his revelation out of his season of suffering is that God actually has no boxes. God is bigger than any theology that we could ever have. And whilst theology is helpful to us, it becomes a hindrance, as I've said before, when we actually put God in a prison. And so Job comes into this place where he holds his theology lightly. Um, and in verse 4, he says, You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer me. Verse 5, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen of you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And he's not beating himself up. He's just come into this place of resolution and acceptance that actually, although it feels sucky uh, what he's going, uh, what's going on in his life, that actually God is who he says he is and even more than he realized he is in. And that's what God wants for you and me in our lives, that he wants us to come into place, a place of resolution around the areas of revelation that he's trying to work into our lives. He wants us to, to break through into a place of uh, just surrender and abandonment, that we come into a, a, a um, uh, the place where Job arrived, uh, where he said, though you slay me, I will trust you. God, I don't understand what's going on, but I know that you're good. And that although I, I, it feels hard and it feels like a mystery, you are good. And I trust you that your goodness and your purposes will be worked out. That I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Um, and, and we see this place of uh, breakthrough that Job uh, arrives at in chapter 42 at the very end of the book that the, the Job that we see here is a different Job than the one that started at the beginning of the book um, and in verse 12 we read that the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part um, and, and there's an important revelation here is that God actually is a God of blessing he is a God of prosperity. Uh, people that have a hang up with the prosperity gospel don't understand actually the, the nature of God. See, when we pray on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying for the nature of heaven to touch our earth in such a way that what it's like up there will touch 
earth down here. And what is heaven like? It's a place of blessing, abundance and prosperity. Now, the thing is that God wants to give us all of that, but so long as it doesn't kill us. And what we see is that Job's carrying capacity for blessing in his life is grown because of his, his deeper understanding of God and his purposes and his ways. Job now has the capacity to hold more of God in his life. And sometimes the promises that God has for you for abundance in your life, if you've ever had prophetic words, haven't been released to you because your carrying capacity isn't there yet. And that if God blessed you uh, as much as he wanted, wants to in your life and intends to, at this point, it would kill you. And because God is loving um, and kind, he will not bless you in that capacity yet. And actually what needs to happen is that you need to grow. You need to come into a place where actually your riches will not destroy you. Uh, Bill Johnson said, how much money is too much money for someone to contain? And, um, and he wisely points out that the point at which they stop trusting God. See, God is the source of your job, believe it or not. Your jobs are not your provision. God is your provision. And whether or not you work or not, God is God over your job. Um, and we sometimes forget that. Um, and so uh, we need to come into this place of recognition that every good and perfect gift that we have ultimately comes from the source of God himself. And the more that we can connect with that reality, the more it sets ourselves up to be able to become carriers of the goodness of God in our lives. And, and those things ultimately we're able to bear in our life because they're not utilized for our own aims and our own good. And I say this uh, often about one of the core beliefs of the church, um, the one that most people have the most difficulty with because it goes against the grain of what people are told about themselves and, and the particular belief system that people wrestle with the most um, is that I am significant. Um, and they wrestle, they wrestle with this because they're told actually, no, we're, we're uh, barely saved sinners, we're worms, that, um, that we're broken people. Uh, and that's not a biblical perspective of the reality of human. Yes, there, is, there are uh, fractures of sin in people's lives, but actually God shows the actual uh, value of every single human being by which that which he was willing to buy back humanity with. And it cost him his, in, his son, his most prized possession. His son was required to buy back your life. And that shows us that your life is equivalent to Jesus. Um, and my, my point in saying this, and what is my point? I've lost my train of thought here. Is, oh, I know what it was. Um, my point is that actually true significance is actually shown similarly by how Jesus lived his life. So if our life is equate, uh, equating to Jesus, our significance is actually demonstrated by how Jesus lived his life. And what does true significance look like? Well, it looks like laying our lives down for another that they may have life. And so God's design for prosperity in our life is not that it would be a bless me up that we can have a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or a Porsche, um, but that which we that we would use those resources to extend his kingdom in the world, to see poverty eradicated, to see uh, blessing come to other people. Um, and for people with a heart to see uh, um, the kingdom of God actually grow and expand in and through other people's lives and in the world, uh, we become a target for the resources of heaven. And Job arrives at this place of greater weight-bearing capacity. And as we read on in verse uh, chapter 42, verse um, 12, we see this expansion of the prosperity of Job in his life. 
Um, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former. He had 14,000 sheep. That sounds like a lot of sheep. 6,000 cab camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. He had seven sons and three daughters. And the three daughters' names were named Jemima, the second Kezi, and the third name Karen Hubbard. And I just want to end with this, um, that, that there's a revelation in the fact that the Bible story here about Job names Job's three daughters because it speaks to this place in God that Job actually arrives at through his suffering. See, in biblical times, um, although women, uh, according to the Jewish perspective of women, um, they were still seen as a second-class citizen. And that really was a consequence of the fall and the brokenness of uh, humanity that comes about as a result of the fall. Um, and although the Jews still retained more so than many other cultures around them, this reverence of the sanctity of the image of God in all humanity, including women, um, uh, what, we, what we don't see is an equality um, in the Old Testament of actually uh, men with women. And the fact that Job here, the very first story that was ever written in the Bible, names Job's three daughters and doesn't name Job's seven sons is saying something more about who Job became as a result of his suffering. See, uh, in biblical times, names actually meant something about the person. But unusually here, the names about, uh, uh, sorry, the names of Job's three daughters really don't carry any significant meaning of God. Um, they're actually more a reflection of Job's carefreeness and joy and delight in life. The first name Jemima means dove. The second name Kezia means a sweet smelling cinnamon powder, like perfume. Um, Karen Huppuck is a container of mascara to actually make your eyes beautiful. See, they have nothing directly to do with God, uh, such as Matthew, which is my, my name, Matty, is finished for Matthew, um, and my name means blessed of God. Um, and, uh, but all of these names here, Jemima, Kezia, Karen, Huckup, are uh, carefree and frivolous names. And really what they're demonstrating is that Job arrives at this peace of life where he has this delight in life. And we often see this of people that have been through real extreme trials and come through the other end. That there is this, uh, there is an absence of stress in their life. There's an absence of the fear of death in their life. When, uh, when, when uh, future struggles or tragedies beset them in their life, they're not overwhelmed by them. There is this, I'm going to be okay um, in the midst of life. Um, that God's got me. Um, and we see this in Job by the demonstration uh, or the, 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 the giving of the three names of Job, Job's daughters. That Job arrives at this freedom in life that actually life is now uh, more fun. It's more easy. Um, and I believe that that's an invitation for all of us. It's, it's, it's the goal for us um, that... God has for us, that he, he wants to invite us into this place of freedom. And, and that's his hope and his design for us um, out of these places of suffering. And I want to pray this um, for you. I want to actually pray that God would get you to this place, that there would be a redemption, a redemption to the, the seasons that either you're going through or you're going to go through, that you would actually see God fulfill his design and purpose um, that he would have out of these seasons. So God, I thank you for all of the lessons that we've learned as we've journeyed through um, looking at pain, suffering, and grief over the last few weeks. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, fulfill your intention for us as a church in, in that we would actually get everything we need to out of um, this, this whole topic area, that, that you would grow the watermark 
of our church in such a way that actually we will become a, a, a center, not just for breakthrough of healing, deliverance, um, and, and the kingdom, but we will become a center of compassion um, and a safe place for people to be able to, to grieve. Um, that we would become better counselors of people that are, are hurting, better friends of those who are aching. Um, better able ourselves to to withstand difficult seasons. Lord, I pray for every single person in the midst of a grief season, a suffering season, um, or or dealing with pain in their life. I pray that there would be um, the revelation of you in the midst of what it is that they're going through. That you would grow in them, that you would complete in them, that which you. Uh, are able to give them in and through this difficult season. Lord, I bless our church to come into the fullness of who we are called to be, uh, which is uh, the reflection of Jesus himself. And you said of Jesus, he was a man acquainted with grief and suffering. Um, and Lord, I pray that Lord, we wouldn't be afraid anymore of grief, suffering and pain. And I pray this for the glory of your church, um, and for, for your purposes to be fulfilled in each and every one of our lives for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Great. Hey, thank you again for uh, joining me this morning. God bless you. I'm looking forward to seeing you back in, per uh, uh, in person, um, in the flesh. Um, feel free to, to post comments um, in the, the chat around things that God has done or spoken to you through the season. Um, and have an awesome week. God bless you.